So the very first week of school when we talked about Java and the variables in Java, we said variables come in two different flavors or types, two general categories. Who remembers what are they? No one remembers? Someone must remember. One's capitalized and one's not capitalized. Does that help? Still no? Yes, Ms. Ria? Okay, so one type is called a class. So these are variable types. And one type is called a class variable. And what did we say the other one? Like uh, when I go like uh, int n equals 3, 3, what is n? It's not a class anymore. Yes, sir? It's a primitive. And by the way, I don't know if I ever mentioned it or not, but what is the three? The three is not a primitive or a class, it's something else. Anyone? This is called a literal. That means it's literally the number three. Okay, we'll talk about literals a different day. <clears throat> now, Within these two, these are the general categories, we can usually distinguish, as I mentioned, by using a capital letter, which is for the classes, and if the variable starts with a small letter, it's a primitive, right? So if I go like this, <clears throat> what is H in this category here? What is it? Mr. Jeremy, what is it? Um, it the variable? Yes, the variable. Is it a is is this h does it come from a class or is it a primitive? Um, primitive? No, sir. House no, wait, is no, capitalized, no. so h is an object or an instance of the class. It's not a primitive. Yeah. If I go like this. What is x now, Mr. Sneed? That's a primitive, see, because double is not capitalized. You see the difference, right? Object or instance of a class, primitive. Primitives in Java don't have methods you can call on them. They're very simple. They're primitive. So now I'm going to confuse the issue slightly by telling you that there are certain things in Java that have counterparts that are sort of related to each other, like one version of it is a primitive and another version is a class. And these are called wrapper classes. And I'll give you an example. Int, if I go int n, that's a primitive, that's a primitive. But I can also go like this, I can also go integer n. I'll give it a different letter, W, here like that. Here, N is a primitive, but W is an instance of this class. And you might be wondering, well, if we already have this, why do we need this? Now, there's a couple of reasons. The first is that the class version is fancier. It's got more features. And there's one particular feature that it has. I already mentioned that classes can have methods associated with them. So this class can do things that the primitive cannot do. The other reason why we need these wrapper classes is later on in the course, I think around unit six or so, five, six, somewhere around there, we're gonna study this thing called an array list, which is basically our ability to put a bunch of things together in a list. And the array list has a weird property that it cannot hold primitives, it can only hold objects. And in case we ever need to hold like a list of integers, we're going to need to use this thing instead of that thing because the array list can't deal with primitives. It can only deal with objects. So those are the two reasons we need to have wrapper classes. So I'm going to show you the three wrapper classes that we're going to discuss. Here they are. So here's wrapper classes. And here's going to be the primitive. And here's going to be the corresponding wrapper.
class. I already told you one of them. One is the int, and the wrapper class is called integer. Then we know double, and the wrapper class is called double. And the third one is boolean, and the wrapper class is called boolean. Why they changed the spelling here from here, I don't know. It would have been much make much more sense to just have it be, I think, int like that, but that's the way they did it. So these are a fancier version of these. Now I'm going to show you the things that these things can do that these cannot do, but already something should be bothering you. If these have like a superset of features over these, why do we need these at all? So it turns out that these have two disadvantages over the fancy versions. These two disadvantages are fairly important because if we have a lot of them, they start to matter. These two disadvantages, by the way, happen to be the two most important things in computer science algorithms, two really, really important things. Can anyone guess what advantages do these have over these? Can you guess one particular advantage? What do you think? Mr. Borden, speed. speed. They're fast. Why are they fast? Because they're simple. Just a bunch of bits sitting there with nothing else encumbering it. Really, really fast. So speed goes to the primitives. There's another reason why the primitives have an, an advantage. Can anyone guess what's the other thing we care about in computer science algorithms? Speed has to do with time. The other one has to do with space. What's the advantage? Yes, Miss Erda? Simplicity. simplicity, but simplicity how? They Yes, Miss Caitlin? <laughs> Memory. I think that's what you were getting at. So time and space, they take up less time and space. They're fast. So if you wanted to keep a list of like 100,000 numbers and wanted to add them together and stuff, doing it with these things will be much faster than trying to do it with these things. But sometimes you just need the fancier version because you have some feature you need to do and these are just too primitive. So let's look at a couple of things that the... Now, I told you what the advantages the primitives have. Now I'm going to show you a few things that the wrapper class can do that the primitives can't do. So sometimes we need to take a number, like let's say we have a number like 37, and we want to convert it into a string. We want to convert it into a string. Right now it's an integer. See that, right? So let's say I go string s equals, now in order to turn this 37 into a string, I need to add some stuff here. This is stuff you should already know. What do I need to put here in order to turn the 37 into a string? I would like you to discuss this with the person next to you, see if you can remember. Okay, Ms. Salodkar, can you tell me what do I do to turn this into a string? Okay, so I can go like this, that's one way, right? But the problem with that is, let's say I have it stored in a variable. Let's say I go int n equals 37. Now can I just go like that? Will that turn it into a 37 as a, as a string? No, right? What would I have to do here instead of using the quotes? Instead of using the quotes, I need to do something. I need to do some math to this to turn it into a string. Yes, sir? You add it to a string. I add it to a string. Which string do I add it to? There's a particular string that I add it to. Could you just do like a nothing string? That's right. A nothing string, or better known as the empty string. There's no spaces in between those double quotes. It's just double quote, double quote. That's known as the empty string. So if I take a variable and add it to the empty string, it turns that variable, or the contents of it, into a string. 
Okay. Similarly, if I had this, and then I turn this into a string, I could turn it into a string like that. So now you can see I just put the, the, the variable, it will put the 4.5, and then it'll add it to the empty string. It'll take it and turn this into, so string s will now contain like that. We learned that earlier in the year when we talked about concatenation operator and how sometimes this is used to add numbers and sometimes it's used to put strings side by side. Today, one of the things we want to talk about is going in the other direction. Let's say we had a string like this. And now we want to turn it back into a number. You can see that's not the number 57, right? That's the string 57. You understand the difference, right? So now we want to turn it back into a number. How do we do that? Well, it turns out that this ability to go from string back to integer is one of the features of our wrapper class called integer. And if you want to convert it back into a a number, you just call this particular method called parse int, and you just give it the string that you want to change. And over here, you can put either integer, or you can even put int there. I'll explain that in a minute. But basically, this is how you would do it. So now what happens is it takes the, it takes this now, and when you you're going to par it's going to parse it as an integer, and it's going to put the result in n. So now n will equal 57. It won't be a string anymore. s will still be a string, but now n will be set to the value of that string. Question, what do you think would happen if I put some gibberish in here mixed in, like 5 uh, uh, b g z 4 like that? What do you think would happen when I go to parse it as an integer? What do you think would happen? What's your gut telling you? Jeremy? Uh, n would be 5 or undefined? Hey, sort of. What does undefined mean, though, in computing? Yes, Mr. Sneed? <clears throat> Sir, it, it, it won't be able to tell at compile time what's in here, because this could be another variable or something. But I think you're heading in the right direction. What's going to happen, Mr. Garofalo? It'll give a runtime error saying there's going to be, it'll like throw red ink all over the screen and say uh, integer uh, a format exception or something like that, basically saying, hey, you told me I could parse this as an integer, but I can't because there's characters in there that I don't recognize as integer characters. So just have to be careful that what's in here is legitimately an integer before you do it. So what I'd like you to do now is, either on your computer or on a piece of paper, I would like you to take this number here, sorry, this string right here, 57.3, and I would like you to try to convert it into the number 57.3 and then print it out. Okay, I'd like you to try that either on paper or on your computer. So I'll start off by declaring it as a string. And now I'd like to convert it into an actual decimal number. You all done, sir? No, I just have a question. OK. Jumping before. So if, it was, uh, if those were like variables that were already declared as integers, it still wouldn't compile. It has to be like the actual number itself. Um, I'm not really following what you're trying to so say. Before, you declared and initialized like a variable n as like an integer with a value of 4. Mm -hmm. Would it plug it in and then use that, or would it just say runtime error? Oh, the parse int, that won't even compile, sir, because if you go parse int, parse int, and you have integer, I see what you're asking. And now, you're saying what would happen if I put a number in there? It won't compile because it ex expects a string here. So when you call parse it, the argument that you pass it has to be a string. It can't be a number or a decimal number or a Boolean or anything like that, or an object. It has to be a, a string here. Okay. Yes, Mr. Pandali? Could I take a stab at 
Okay, sir, we're going to try to convert this into a decimal number. Go ahead. Okay, that's very good, sir. That is correct. That is the right way to convert a string into a decimal number. We're all good? Okay, now I want to show you how to create these, uh, these wrapper objects and how to convert between wrapper objects and primitives, etc. So let's say we wanted to create a, 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 a double object, double object, like we'll call it X, I think you said, right? And let's say we got, we're going to create a new double object. Now, based on what you know already about how you create objects in Java, uh, let's say we want to create the number uh, 54.7, I think we had. What would I need to put here in order to make that happen? What do you think? This is, remember, this is a class now, right? That's a class. That's an object. Remember how we made dogs? Remember I showed you today earlier how to make a house, right? Now I want to make a double. What do you think? Mr. Yasser, you are now student of the day for me. That means that I'm going to give you uh, 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 a little prize at the end of class. But I'm retiring you for a little while, sir. I want to hear from someone else. Uh, uh, who else uh, can tell me? how to uh, convert this into a decimal uh, number. What do you think? What do I do? What do I put here on the right-hand side? OK, Ms. Ria. I go new, double. And then what do I put in here in the parentheses, Miss? OK, that's what I do. I put 54.7. You see that? So this basically takes the decimal literal, that's a literal, and converts it into a object. You see that? Now, uh, I could also go the other way. I can, um, if I wanted to take the double here, like let's say I go double y. Now, this is a, this is a primitive. See that? That's a primitive. And I want to take this x, and I want to convert it back into a, a small double, a primitive. Like I want to go from object to primitive. All right, so, the, um, so before you left for lunch, I was having trouble uh, remembering the method to convert from the the um, object version back to the primitive version, and the method is called double value. So basically, you take it and you, you take the object here and you call this method on it called double value, and it will turn it back into a primitive for you. So imagine if I had this now, if I had integer. something like that, and I wanted it to turn it into a regular integer. How would I do that here? Who wants to take a guess at, take a, a guess? So here is how I take a object of type double and convert it into a primitive double. What do you think would be the sequence to take a object of type integer and convert it to a primitive int? Okay, Ms. Ria, you're up. Uh, it's uh, it's going to be, what, what would be the variable here, Miss? Yeah, it's actually called integer value, but it could have easily been what you said. Could have been int value. This is why I wish they hadn't used the whole word. They should have just used the first three letters, but that's what they used. So, so here it's not, Miss, because it's a method, and methods are not capitalized in Java. Only classes are capitalized. So you can see here, this is how you go back and forth. So this went on for a little while, and then the users of Java are like, we hate this. It's so painful to go back and forth, and they're so similar. Couldn't you folks at Oracle, who own Java, by the way, couldn't you make it simpler for us to convert back and forth between the object versions of these uh, primitives and the primitives themselves. And then finally the Oracle folks said, yes, we hear your complaint and we're going to put in this feature. And this feature I'm about to describe to you is really important because it's used a lot on the AP exam. It's called auto boxing. There's also an un, uh, un auto boxing, which uh, will make Unautoboxing, which goes in the other direction, which will be quite obvious from when I show you. 
but we'll just talk about this one for now, autoboxing. So autoboxing refers to the fact that there are some cases where instead of writing it out like this, instead of writing it out like this, for certain types of classes, we provide a shortcut where you don't have to call the constructor. The constructor call is implied. Now, you've already seen this in one place where I go like this. If I go string s equals abc, now you can see that here I didn't go string s equals new string abc. I just gave it the string, and it created the string for me. Now, this is not autoboxing. This is something else. But in any case, I'm going to show you now how this works. It's very simple. You just go like this. You just go double. So instead of doing this, you just go double x equals 54.7, like that. Now, this should disturb you a little bit, because what I have on this side is a literal, and what I have on this side is an object. And usually, we don't assign a literal to an object using an assignment statement. Usually, we have to go new. And then we have to call the constructor and pass the literal to the constructor. The constructor runs and builds an object for us. In other words, the constructor, what it does is it takes this literal and it puts a box around it to create an object. And then it stores it in this variable here. But what's happening is that this literal is being auto-boxed. The compiler is coming along and converting this into this for you because you're too lazy to write it. Got that? So here you can see it's creating the double object for you without a call to new. That's unusual in Java. Usually in Java, the only way to create new objects is with the keyword new. But I've already shown you two exceptions now. I showed you one with strings, and I'm showing you now one with the wrapper classes. The reason you don't need the new keyword for the wrapper classes is because of this auto-boxing feature. You can also go the other way. If you have a, a, an object of type double, you can also do this, like that, and it will unbox it for you. It will take the value out of the box and turn it into a primitive for you. So you can see that those methods that I was showing you before about double value and uh, integer value and all that business, we rarely use those. I don't think they're going to be tested on the AP. They used to be before uh, all this auto-boxing stuff came out. But I don't, I, I don't know for sure, but I don't think those are on the exam anymore because you can just auto-box and un auto-unbox everything. Here, am I boxing or unboxing? What am I doing? Mr. Degouge, what am I doing, sir? I'm unboxing. See, I'm taking the, this has got a box around it because it's an object. See that? Yes, sir. OK, so it sounds like you still have to be able to do the old stuff. As you have to still know the old stuff? Is that what you're saying? Oh, OK. But it will ask you if this compiles, yes. but not, not this. Both at the same time, the whole thing. Oh, OK. All right, so it looks like you have to remember that you can do it both ways. That's good input. They don't let me see the exam, by the way. So that, in a nutshell, is, and this works for the integers also. So here you can see if I have this. You can see here I am boxing the 17, creating an object out of it. And likewise, I can later turn it into back into a primitive by unboxing it. So that's how I box and unbox the three types. Now, in every other situation where I teach you some new thing in Java, I give you a bunch of practice problems right afterwards to help sync it in. This is actually going to be saved now for unit five or six when we do um, array lists. We'll be using many of these features. So there will be only very sparse, if any, coverage of this, maybe like one question on your unit two test, or maybe two at the most on this uh, wrapper class stuff. Ver very little coverage of this on the, on the actual test for unit two. Okay.